Come on, sing it out. It's like sweet, sweet honey on my lips. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like the sound of a symphony to my ears. Like holy water on my so hard the water fell off the the table over here that was awesome <laughs> you guys are ready for it you're ready for it all right well we are ready to encounter the presence of the lord today and welcome him man he's doing a new thing isn't he oh come on church he's doing a new thing isn't he amen are we gonna start that we don't have to start that first song again and go through it <laughs> y'all gotta be with us now come on now god's doing a new thing isn't he amen all right. I'm not mad with y'all. I'm just kind of expecting about 10% more involvement. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> with my whole heart and with my whole life and with my innermost being, I bow in wonder and love before you, the Holy God. Yahweh, you are my soul's celebration. Are you looking for celebration today? Guess who is your soul's celebration? Yahweh. Yahweh, you are my soul's celebration. How could I ever forget the miracles and kindness you've done for me? You have kissed my heart with forgiveness in spite of all I've done. You've healed me inside and out from every disease. You've rescued me from hell and saved my life. You've crowned me with love and mercy. You have supercharged my life so that I can soar again like a flying eagle in the sky. Oh, you gotta love that. 
you have supercharged my life so that I can soar again like a flying eagle in the sky. I like that a lot. So Lord, you have supercharged our life. We are standing in your love and shame and fear have no place. Amen? I say shame and fear have no place. Amen? Y'all got to get vocal now. All right? La, la, la. La, la, la. Yeah, come on. La, la, la. La, la, la. Yeah, sing it with me. La, la, la. La, la, la. Yeah. Come on. La, la, la. La, la, la. Yeah, let me hear you. La, la, la. Ten percent more. La, la, la. La, la, la. Yeah, let me hear you. When darkness tries to roll over my bones Come on hey. When sorrow comes to steal the joy I own When brokenness and pain is all I know Oh, I won't be shaken No, I won't be shaken Come on, sing it My fear doesn't stand a chance when I'm standing
doesn't stand a chance when the perfect love of the Lord is here and the perfect love of the Lord is here. So receive the perfect love. Come on. Just lift your hand and say, I receive the perfect love of my Father. I receive it. Let fear go in Jesus' name. Fear doesn't belong in a son and daughter's heart. Fear go in Jesus' name. Shame go. Guilt go in Jesus' name. We receive your grace and your love. Amen? Amen. We receive your grace and your love. Say, God, I receive it. God, I receive it. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So as we sing this next song, I just wanted to encourage you this morning to really lift your gaze up to the Lord. Um, this past week, I had to take my son in for a procedure, and he was really panicked and really fearful, and he was hyperventilating. We we're trying to calm him down, and I just kept saying to him, just look at my eyes, look at my eyes, because I knew if I caught his gaze that he would see the love that I had for him, and he would see that I was right there with him, and I felt like the Lord was just speaking to me and saying, that's what I see about you, that's what I feel about you. If you would just look at my gaze, if you would just look at me, then all of the things that are going on around you will fade away because you'll be overwhelmed by my love and not your circumstance. So this morning, I just declare that, Lord, we look to you. We're not going to be overwhelmed by what's going on, Lord. We're going to just gaze into your eyes. We're going to worship you for you are holy.
and he reigns over every circumstance. He reigns over every disease. That we don't have to be worried. We don't have to be afraid. Because his love, his love is with us and it is reigning in this place today. So if you believe that, declare it with me. Hallelujah. stretches. Let everything bless the Lord. So we join with all of creation, with all the believers around this planet, blessing the name of the Lord. And the scripture talks about a lot about looking back at the benefits that he's given us, looking back at the blessings that the Lord has bestowed on your life. So I just want us to close our eyes just a minute just to meditate on that. Just think about the times that God has been faithful to you. And even in the times that you thought he'd given up, he had something in mind that you didn't even see. It was around the corner and you didn't see it. And you thought he had abandoned you. And then you went around that corner and you saw him. That he had majestically set up this next situation for you. So think about those times. Think about that moment when you realized that there was forgiveness and mercy and grace in his name. And you embraced him. Think about the first time that you heard that Jesus had died for you. That you were so valuable that the Lord had given his life for you. Think about that time he delivered you from addiction and he healed you from that sickness. Just meditate on those times. Meditate on them. Think about those times and bless his name. Lord, we bless your name for your faithfulness. You have always been there. You have never let us down. You have been with us. So we bless you, God. We bless your holy name. We lift up our hallelujahs to you. We say hallelujah. Our God reigns. Thank you, Lord. Just thank him now. Thank him. We thank you, Lord, for the cross. We thank you for your blood. We thank you that when we surrender to you, Lord, you didn't want slavery for us. You wanted freedom. Thank you, God. Just thank him. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We bless you, Lord. And a big part of that blessing is giving. We give because, not out of duty or out of an obligation, but because of our love for Him, because of grace that's been bestowed on us, because we love Him. So this, now's the time when we worship God through giving. A lot of you give online, and for our Facebook Live friends, we know that you're giving online. We love that, but some, some of you guys like to come and bring a, an offering to the King. 
So we have our God's treasure box to the left and the right. If you'd like to bring your offering during this, this part of blessing the Lord. So that if you would, raise your hands and make this declaration with me. Say, I give not out of obligation, not out of duty, but out of love. I give not out of obligation, but out of love. So let's give to our King. He's worthy. Amen? Let's bless him.
lift up your blessing and praise to our King now. Come on, lift your voice. It's the blessing to your King. Let's thank Him. Come on, church. Lift up your voice and thank Him. Thank Him. Thank Him. forgetting your benefits we're not forgetting your blessings Jesus we're not forgetting the times you healed us for no no we're not forgetting the times you set us free oh we're not forgetting the times you rescued our loved one that time of sorrow when you gave us peace we're not forgetting now we're not forgetting now oh Remember your love. We remember your love now. We remember your love, Jesus. Yeah, we remember your grace, oh God. We remember your forgiveness. Yeah. We remember the joy you bring to our hearts, oh God. Just remember, come on, church, remember. Giving us guidance when we were lost. Yeah. Making a way when there was no way. Oh. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We remember your love. Come on, sing that. We remember your love. We remember your love. Jesus, yeah. Remember that grace, yeah. Let's thank him for his victory that he brought in our lives. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. You may be seated. God is good. We're continuing a message series called Happy New You. Are you happy? Are you happy? Come on, church. Are you happy? All right, cool. Check out your screens as we continue our message series. It's time to be made new by every revelation that's been given to you and to be transformed as you embrace the glorious Christ within as your new life and live in union with Him. All right, well, as we are starting this morning, we've got a lot going on in our family that I want us just to start together in a word of prayer about. We actually have a number of people in our family right now that uh, have come down sick this week, are unable to be with us, so they are with us on Facebook Live, so everybody turn back to the cameras there. We love you, and we're going to take a minute here on campus to pray for you online that are homesick today. Um, so we're going to do that in just a minute, just to pray for God's healing and grace upon them. Um, also this morning, Pastor Lynn is at Abide Church this morning. One of the most beautiful things we get to walk out as a church family is we believe in the church with the big C. We believe in the church of Jesus Christ for the city of Tampa. And so Pastor Lynn is our lead pastor, walks as an apostolic father over this region. And God has brought him in relationship with about 20 different pastors in the Tampa Bay area. And regularly, he just goes out from beyond our walls as Overflow Church to bless them. And so as he's standing with Abide Church, Pastor Gio and Destiny today, 
They've got a huge moment. They've got a prophetic conference coming, and God right now is releasing stuff that we're going to come into agreement with. Amen? And then in that, um, we have some news together as a family that is, that is heartbreaking, and yet it's a, it is a fulfillment of the way everything should be. Um, our dear sister, Darlene McKeon, who has been a longtime member with us, went home to be with the Lord um, this week. And so as she has run her race faithfully, we want to pray for her daughter and for her family. But i got to tell you, Darlene always came to our services and sat right here in the front row, and she's got a much better front row seat this morning. Mm -hmm. Because she is standing before the King of Glory. So together, I'm just going to ask that we would pray together. If you would just extend your hands, we're going to pray for those three things this morning. So Jesus, right now, we ask for our brothers and sisters, our friends of Overflow Church that are sick and that are battling right now, that are at the place where they can't be here, even for those, Lord, that have just been at a place of recovering. I thank you already that by your stripes you say that we're healed, that everything that we need for body, soul, and spirit was already paid on Calvary. You already did it. There's no further payment that is needed. And so right now, Jesus, we're agreeing with you that everything you purchased for these sons and daughters, that everything that you want for them would come to them now, that your healing would come. And Lord, the word that we pray for them that is in this time of rest, that you would give restoration. As they rest, that in every way you would restore all around them, restore relationships, restore their time, restore their energy, realign, work and move. Lord, we bless our friends. We thank you, Lord, for Abide Church. We bless Pastor Lynn today as he is going out there. And we agree with the purposes of heaven for Abide. We bless you, Abide. We bless you, uh, Pastor Gio and Destiny. I thank you, Lord, for my brother that is such a firebrand for the gospel. He loves you and wants your intimacy more than anything. And so, Lord, I honor Gio today. And I ask that as he stands, that you would give him the desires of his heart because the desire of his heart is for you. I pray, Lord, and we agree with you right now for the places you want to release freedom at Abide Church all around their community today. The place you want to give a word that somebody's getting set free of an addiction today. We agree with you. And Lord, we bless our lead pastor as he goes. Thank you so much, Lord, for Pastor Lynn, the vision that you've given him, the favor that you've given him. Continue to surround him. And we just ask like the prayer of Jabez, Lord, that you would expand his tent pegs, that you would give him the strength and the grace and the favor that, Lord, uh, the pastors of our city would be fathered. And Father, we thank you for our sister Darlene. What a faithful, beautiful daughter and friend. We honor her. Lord, I thank you for the race that she ran. I thank you for the love she carried with you. And I thank you that today, truly, she's more alive than she's ever been. So Lord, we don't need to pray for Darlene, but we do pray, Lord, for her daughter and we pray for her family. And I pray as they think on the memories of their life with their mom, with their friend, that you'd help them to remember and to grieve well and that you would be with them in all of it. If you agree, that say, amen. 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 Well, I'm excited for us to talk this morning because in these last months, as we've been going from 2020 into 2021, the same question I've been asked over and over and over again. And this same question, I believe if we would answer it, it's going to empower us to advance the kingdom of God in the days that are ahead. And the question I've been asked is this, how do we respond? How do we respond? In the midst of bitterness and anxiety and fear of a world that is on edge like it's literally waiting for the other shoe to drop. I mean, you feel that, right? How do we respond? How do we respond in the midst of the politics and the news and the noise, the 8 billion unfiltered opinions that are spewing out at the speed of sound? How do we respond to brokenness and injustice? How do we respond when we look around us? And we have to be honest that our culture is failing to love our neighbor as ourself by either our deliberate action to silence and oppress and oppose or our oblivious inaction where we need to speak up and to stand in the dock and instead find ourselves insulating our own interests and comforts and reputations. How do we respond to sin? How do we respond when we have things that we are convinced the enemy has come to steal, kill, and destroy from people we very much love? How do we respond to seemingly unanswered prayers? To where we've been seeking God and we've been trying to walk the way that he said, we're not yet seeing fruit or worse, it all seems to be getting worse. If following Jesus means a happy new you, then the question we have to ask at 2021 is what is our happy new response as the followers of Jesus? Practically speaking, how do we walk well as disciples? How do we walk well as followers who bear the name of Christ? And when we step to this question, I want us to remember 
There's already been lots of noise and there are no shortage of opinions. So my desire for us this morning is not to add to the noise, but instead to ask Jesus Christ, the living word of God, who is sharper than any two-edged sword to cut through the confusion and the disillusionment and the heaviness and the fear. To ask Jesus to come this morning like a surgeon's scalpel, to cut us open on the surgery table and to reveal the thoughts and intents of our hearts, what's driving our thoughts, what's driving our motives. That he would lift our heads, that he would align our feet, so that in the days ahead we would run well as carriers of hope. And so, if you're wanting the same thing I'm wanting this morning, and I believe you do, do you want that? Then I'm just going to ask from the start that we would just pray a very simple prayer together this morning. Would you just say this? Say, Jesus, I ask you right now to reveal your heart to me. I ask you to reveal my heart to me. I ask you to heal me where I'm broken. And I ask you to fill me with hope. I want to respond well. You agree with that? Amen. So how do we respond? The next two weeks, I'm going to talk about what is the response for the followers of Christ in the days that we're in. And I want to tell you, if we're going to respond well, we must start with silence and find strength in stillness. We must start with silence and find strength in stillness. And I want to tell you there are three attributes I believe we have to possess at the foundation of our heart before we have any business speaking with from our mouths for God. Three attributes that we have to have. Perspective, humility, and compassion. And these three attributes that are given from the Holy Spirit, they're forged best in stillness and silence. And so first we have to return to stillness. And when I define stillness, I mean this. I would say stillness is the neighborhood where you rediscover God's perspective. Stillness is when you pull into the neighborhood that you stop hearing everybody else's opinion, you stop hearing everybody else's take, you stop hearing the left, you stop hearing the right, and you come to the center. You come to the altar. You step into the neighborhood where you regain God's perspective on the events in our world. And we need that. Amen? So I think about re-entering the neighborhood, and i got to tell you, I think of my own hometown. So I grew up in what was then a tiny, remote um, community just north of Tampa, a farmland known as Wesley Chapel. Maybe you've heard of it. When I moved there, it was all farmland. There was a Circle K, a McDonald's, and they were building a Winn-Dixie. It was the talk of the town. And for the next 15 miles, a 15-mile radius around my house, there was nothing else. It was still, and it was quiet, and it was beautiful. Now today, if you go to the same place to Wesley Chapel, you're going to find that it is home to thousands of businesses. There are several car dealerships, two shopping malls, a movie theater, a lot with every single restaurant and superstar, a superstore you can name. I, I would challenge you to try. You go there, you want to find it, it's in Wesley Chapel. They're filled now beyond their capacity with activity and noise, and there are a few places that are left quiet. And this is what I feel when I think about that. The same thing that happened to my hometown is happening to our souls. The same thing that happened in my quiet hometown is happening right now to our souls, and it's killing us. I want you to consider this. There has been more information communicated in the last two years than all of the years of prior human existence before that point. Let that sink in. In the last two years, we've said more than the whole combined human history before that. Every day, the average person is consuming 34 gigabytes of data. That's 100,000 words of new information. To put that in perspective, all of Tolstoy's War and Peace is 460,000 words. It means you're taking in that much new information every four and a half days. And most of us aren't taking it in by reading, right? I don't think it's Tolstoy that we're taking in every four and a half days. No, actually, most of us are taking it in through screens, through listening and watching at a whopping five hours a day on average. That doesn't include time that we spend on radio and audio sources, another 2.2 hours. And the time we actually spend reading articles and books, that's another 36 minutes of our day for seven and a half hours of us taking in information, 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 information. I hear some people sometimes say, well, the world, the world's just getting so bad. 
the world's getting so dark. But I would say this, if you're a student of history, you understand this is not the darkest moment we've ever lived in. Because apart from Jesus Christ, human nature doesn't change. It's only the transmission of information that does. And so this is what I mean. A hundred years ago, everything that happened was localized. We weren't being constantly bombarded with every global story of struggle and loss and depravity. And because of that, it allowed us perspective to see what was broken and what was beautiful right before our eyes. We could see it all. We could watch beauty from ashes because we could see brokenness and beauty. But now we walk with an endless diet of news, which anymore just means everyone's editorial opinion. Tons of people today are consuming fatalistic, fear-centered, angry voices that are obsessed with everything that's broken. It's their buffet at 7.5 hours a day, and I want to tell you, that is skewing our view of reality. I want you to hear this quote from psychologist Robert Lee. He says this. He says, the average high school kid today has the same level of anxiety as the average psychiatric patient in the early 1950s. And when the article go to, went on to state why that was, he said there are two factors that are contributing to it more than anything else. That teenagers today have a low level of safe social connection and a high level of environmental threat. They have a low level of safe social interaction. Now on one side, teenagers are more plugged in than they've ever been before. They've got every avenue. They're with friends all the time. But there are very few people they actually feel they can be safe and vulnerable and real with and look eye to eye. And at the same time, every time they open their ears, all they hear all the time is a bunch of adults talking like Chicken Little that the sky is falling. There's a high environmental threat. And because of that, their anxiety is going through the roof. So I want to make this clear. Listen to me. The human heart, our need for a Savior, and the sufficiency of the gospel is the same today as it was when we were 10 feet outside of Eden. So how do we respond? And I want to tell you, I believe we have to start with stillness. We have to start and be honest that many of us have allowed the farmland of our soul to welcome developers that have turned our peaceful portion with God into a chaotic metropolis, and it is time to evict some tenants. Many of us have come to the place that we have added to the noise. See, today, all of us, we're full of input, aren't we? And full of information and full of opinions, but there are many people that are starving for stillness and starving for peace. They're starving to taste again and see that God is still good and still on the throne, and they need to be still because that's where we know that he's God. I love Psalm 46.10. It says it this way. It says, surrender your anxiety. Be silent and stop your striving and you will see that I am God. I am the God above the nations and I will be exalted throughout the whole earth. And I want to promise you something, no matter what's going on in your life today, for the rest of eternity, that is unchanging truth. He is God. He will be established among the nations. That's the news report from heaven today, by the way. Sounds a little bit different than CNN, MSNBC, and Fox News, right? Yes. That he is God. That he is reigning. Some of y'all might need to take that verse and put it on your mirror. Where do we start? We have to be still and know that he's God. We have to turn back to intimacy again because all of the bad news that we've heard has blinded us from seeing the beauty, blinded us from seeing hope, and blinded us from seeing where Aslan is presently on the move. Our king reigns, and we desperately need perspective. And so I want to be practical this morning. I believe for most of us what that means is we need to have more time that we're turning off screens and turning down voices to regain perspective. Do you agree with that? I'm so glad you do, because I want to give you some practical ways we could do something about that this week. And so as you look at this screen right now, I want to get practical of ways we can choose stillness. Because remember, it's in stillness that we get perspective. It's in stillness that we can again see the broken and the beautiful. So how do we do it? For some of you, you might need to take a social media break for a week. Some of you might need to take a month. Some of you might be like, sayonara 2021. I don't know if you met those people on, on Facebook. You're like, you need a timeout. Somebody just needs to send you to the corner and take your keyboard away, right? You, if you have nothing nice to say, 
say nothing at all, and if some people did that, their Facebook profiles, you would think, are canceled. So, some need to take a social media break for a week. Maybe you'd give yourself some times of unplugged times with your family where you put all of your devices away. We had unplugged worship this morning, which is great and is refreshing. Maybe you need unplugged times in your family where you come and literally, when I was a teacher, we called it a phone jail. So everybody comes in, you're like, all the phones go here, all the devices go here, all the notifications go here. And you know what's so awesome? My son Bradley did this on his own last week. And he came to me and said, hey, I'm just taking all my devices away for this number of hours a week, and my productivity has gone through the roof, and I feel so much at peace. And it's like, yeah, because you know what? You weren't meant to be a human doing. You were meant to be a human being. You're not supposed to be available 24 hours a day. And so for some of you, you need time to just step away. I could be practical about how you could do those unplugged times. You could schedule a do not disturb time on your phone. If you have an iPhone, I love this. iPhone allows you to give an actual like, um, auto response that you can edit yourself. And so sometimes you'll send a text to me and you'll hear back. Hey, I'm unavailable to meet with you or I'm in a place where I have limited reception. Here's a news flash for you. I'm in Florida. Everywhere there's reception all the time. What that means is not that I don't have reception on this. It means that I don't have reception for you right now in this. What it means right now is I'm not available for anything else because I've chosen to turn off the noise and I need to hear the heart of my father. Because if I'm ever going to have anything to say out of my mouth, I first must have stillness in my heart. So some of us need to be at the place where we turn on those do not disturb times. Some need to manage your notifications. Okay, I got to the place with Facebook, I just turned off my notifications because I'd be going about my day and they'd be, oh, they said that? Ooh, they said, I should probably see what they said. And then the next thing you know, it's 45 minutes in an endless stream. They said that and she said that. How could they say that? They think that. Well, let me see. Let me check their profile and see what they actually think about that. Some of you need to just turn it off. For some, maybe you're at the place where you've got to go on a data diet you need to intentionally decrease the number of informational calories that you are taking in every day because it's hurting you. It's making you sick. It's making your hope sick. By the way, if you find that you're pessimistic, I would consider going on a data diet because what that means, you are made for joy. You are made for life. So if that's not what's pouring out of you, then what that means is you're taking in the wrong information. You're taking in the wrong perspective. We find perspective in stillness. For some of you scheduling quiet hours in your house where you can tell your family, we're going to pray, we're going to read, walk, nap, write, color, draw, just no noise from this hour to that hour. When I was a resident advisor in college, we had quiet hours. You do whatever you want, just don't make noise. And I want to tell you, if you do quiet hours in your home, don't have them only quiet hours because everybody has their earbuds in. That kind of defeats the purpose. I mean times where we're turning off all the other voices and actually hearing our Father. Or maybe for you it would be to get outside in nature. See, stillness is what brings perspective in our life. And if you are not being still, I want to make you a promise this morning. If you are going, 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 if it's information, 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 I don't care if it's conservative or liberal sources. I want you to hear me. If you are not being still, then your perspective of God and you and others and what's really happening in the world is distorted. Because it's only when we choose to be still that we can see where he's God. We desperately need perspective. Because if we walk the way without perspective, here's what's going to happen in life. If you don't have perspective, I promise, you're either going to walk panicked or pessimistic. You're either going to walk around all the time like the sky is falling and like it's over and these are the darkest days. Or at every point, it's going to be your Eeyore when you were made to be Tigger. And when you walk in a way where you're panicked or pessimistic, there's only two results. You will either chase conspiracies or you will build bunkers i got to tell you, to the outside world, do you know what they say is true of evangelical Christians? They're the most prone people on the planet to chase conspiracies. i got to tell you, I've been a pastor now over 20 years. At this point, I've heard everybody is the Antichrist in my email inbox. They can't all be right, right? This one's the Antichrist because the number of letters in his name. And this is the, did you hear what's going on in the Middle East? They're all going to mark us. We're going to die. Because when you listen to voices and not your father, you start to act like an orphan. When you act like an orphan, you start to chase conspiracies. And if you chase conspiracies, I promise it won't be long before you build bunkers. Where you surround yourself only with people who think like me, only with people who talk like me. And listen, I, I might step on a few toes, and I'm doing it in love. But when people say there's something wrong, and I'm not saying for you as a person, but when we as a people say, you know what, I don't like this social media platform because they say this, that, 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 and that, and that. And I'm just going to get in a social media platform with just people who look like me. I just want to remind you, Jesus and the disciples did the exact opposite of that. They did not surround themselves only with people who thought, acted, tasted, smelled, touched like them. They went as light into the darkness. We desperately need to regain perspective.
And so the first thing I'm going to call us to do today is to choose stillness. But I want to tell you we can't stop there because we must find strength in silence. In particular, there are two kinds of silence I'm talking about that I believe we have a deficiency of in our culture. It's the silence to learn and the silence to listen. If I had to state them another way, it would be the silence that would plant roots of humility and the silence that bears fruit of compassion. So this silence to learn, what am I talking about? This is where we're planted in humility. Jesus was once asked, how are we great in the kingdom of God? What makes us great? And his response was this. He said it's the people that would choose to change the way they think and to become like a child. You know the word he used for child there? It was the word toddler. He said if you want to know how to be great in the kingdom of God, you need to be a toddler. You know what's true of toddlers? They're ones whose whole existence and whole effort is found because they're just aware, they're just getting their bearings. They're taking all of their strength and energy just to make sure they're standing. They would never have the audacity to pose as an expert to write the book on what running looks like. The truth is we're toddlers, not experts. I'll tell you what I mean from that. If you have lived 80 years on planet Earth, okay, we would all admit 80 is... Aged and wise, right? If you've lived 80 years on planet Earth, I want you to understand that is one tiny second in one tiny strand of civilization on one tiny corner of the world with a few tiny viewpoints of the way the world works that your peers say you know with authority. We're toddlers, not experts. If you parented five kids, and I have, you could only be referred to as an expert in comparison to the person who has parented no kids. Because if you actually were to look at all children that have ever been born, five children is an infinitesimally small, ridiculous, tiny number for any parent to have the audacity to stand up and say, I've got five of this whole number, but I'm an expert on this thing called parenting. And the same thing is true in every other field of thought. It's true in morality, and theology, and psychology. It's true in the economy, and it's true in politics. So I want to say this humbly but strongly to us brothers and sisters. We do not know as much about God and the solution to the world's problems as we think we do. We desperately need humility and teachability. And let the Apostle Paul in Romans 12 to pen these words. He said, for by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment. We have a great tendency to fool ourselves. To forget the depth of grace that is being continually extended to us. And if we're not careful, to talk and act as if we've done something to earn our place of standing. Now we would never say that out of our mouths, but do you know how we show we believe that we've shifted from being a child to being an expert? It's shown when we open our mouths to quickly state our opinion when someone does something that I wouldn't do that way. You see, when we show up there, we move from being toddlers to self-appointed experts. And when we do that, it's only a tiny step before I feel like I'm qualified or even called to critique another uh, kid whose walk does not look as well as mine does in that area yet. We've shifted from the role of walking as a fellow child under the same father to a junior parent. Now, I've got to ask parents in the room, do you ever have any kids? I know it doesn't happen in your home. But do you ever have any kids that shift from acting like a child in your home to acting like a junior parent? Like they're in charge and they're given the rules? Isn't that so annoying? Guess how it looks to the world when we do it. See, all of our days, what we've been called to be every day, every hour of every day is simply children. Now, Paul says, don't look at yourself more highly than you ought. Of course, we've got to look at the other error. Sometimes we think too lowly of ourselves. Sometimes we walk around with our heads slumped like we're a failure or an outcast or an inconvenience. And if that's you this morning, I want to remind you that you are worthy of nothing less than the shed blood of Jesus Christ himself. He is giddy with delight to adopt you as his child and wants nothing more for all of his days than to put his arm around you and say, this is my closest friend and all that I have all of the time is fully available to them. So lift your head high because listen, Listen, Paul says this, when you walk in the world and you see yourself either more highly than you ought to or more lowly than you ought to, you lack sober judgment. You know what he's saying? 
it's like your soul is drunk. You're going around in a way that you are fooling yourself. Your view of reality is being distorted. And I want to let you know, people who choose to speak while fooling themselves sound like drunken fools. I want you to understand that. You want to ask, what do I think is going on from a lot of Christians who are opening their mouth right now? Right here. People who choose to speak without perspective and without a humility about their place in the world under their Father, their place in creation. If you choose to speak while fooling yourself, you sound like a drunken fool. So let me unpack that. If your attitude in any area of politics or morality or justice is, I'm getting this right and those people are the problem, that's a gracious invitation from your Father to find strength in silence. I want you to hear the words of Jesus. In Luke chapter 18, he says this. He said, to some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like these other people. Robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but he beat his breast instead and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And I tell you, this man rather than the other went home justified before God. So therefore, I tell you, all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but those who humble themselves will be exalted. I want you to hear me very, very clearly. When I say that our first response in a broken and messed up world is silence, I'm not talking about a passive silence. I'm talking about a cleansing silence. I'm talking about a silence that will ensure that when we speak, it will be the heart of our Father coming out and not the accuser. When I talk about silence, what I'm talking about is a constructive silence. I'm talking about you and I making the choice that we would never leave the place of being a child or a student to ever dare to come into creation as if we're called to play instructor. That we would always be building, that we would always be asking, that we would always be growing in wonder. And listen, Psalm 19 says that creation shouts God's glory. So guess what that means? If even inanimate creation shouts who God is, that means for you today, every person and every circumstance and every situation you encounter is an invitation to deepen your view of God if you would stop talking and listen. That's why, by the way, I'm not threatened when I talk with people who see the world through a different lens than me. They're not my enemy their iron that has been called to sharpen me. Because listen, it's an invitation from God. When I hear somebody that believes something that I don't, it's either an invitation from God to realign what I believe or to refine it. Either I listen and I find out that the way I've been seeing God is not worthy of His glory, and so I need to go and realign. Yay, glad I listened. Or they share something and it challenges my spirit and it causes me to go into my prayer closet and dig deeper for the reason, for the hope that I have, and it refines it and strengthens it. And then I have something to actually offer. We've got to stop being afraid of people's different opinions. We've got to stop building spiritual monasteries. Amen. I love when people ask me deep and messy questions about God and morality and politics and the world. I love when they come and challenge what I believe. I have no need to run or silence or vilify or disprove them. Instead, you know what I do? I applaud them. Because they remind me that I need to ask mess messy questions myself. And then I need to patiently keep asking messy questions until I develop mature convictions that have passed through the refiner's fire. I want to remind us that God is a big boy. And it's not just that he can handle your questions and your doubts and your figuring out of this world. I'm going to say that you and I will never have any faith or hope of any substance until we're willing to wrestle. Because beliefs that can't be challenged are fragile and weak. They are a house of cards ready to blow over. So I want you to hear me. When I say that we start with silence, I am not saying don't have convictions. I'm not saying be a spiritual marshmallow, right? Like you're just the, the bounce house for Jesus. Just everybody comes near and I'm cushy and I'm fun and I'm warm. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is this. 
May we stop being so quick to speak and unwilling to listen that we wouldn't adopt only superficial convictions we would use as weapons against the very ones we're called to rescue. I will, Pastor Cindy. Thanks for asking. <laughs> Don't be so quick to speak and so unwilling to listen that you adopt only superficial convictions that you will use as weapons against the very ones you're called to rescue. The time will come over and over and over where we have to speak. That's why there's two weeks where I'm talking about how we respond. This one's all about silence. Next week, we're going to talk about what comes when it's time to open your mouth. Because listen, we have to start with silence, but we can't end there. For some of you right now, you're prophets and you're burning inside and you're like, the world's broken. Somebody needs to tell them we need to go. And some of you are shepherds and you're like, I like this silence thing. I don't have to stand out and say anything contrary. Yes, mm, warm, comfy Jesus. He's like a Snuggie. I just want to put this on. I want to tell you, listen, we start with silence. You can't end there. You've heard, as I have, the quote that has gone down well in history, that the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men and women to do nothing. So I want to be very clear. We need bold, transforming truth. Because people who are experiencing darkness need more than warm affection. They need somebody to come into the darkness and take them by the hand and lead them to the light. Where there's an enemy who steals and kills and destroys, it says that Jesus came not just to encourage, but to destroy the works of the enemy. So we need boldness. But please hear me. Boldness and humility were never meant to be enemies. Boldness and humility were never meant to stand mutually exclusive at odds. In fact... Bold truth spoken humbly is the recipe of a healing balm. If you don't have humility and you don't have truth, then you don't have transformation. But before we speak, please hear me. We must make sure that we're speaking from a heart of humility. Because without humility, we will walk harsh or hypocritical. The result will be that we will be abrasive and offensive and blind to our own complicity. It's everything we see from the Pharisees of Jesus' day. And by the way, if you read the Pharisees and go, those idiots, you could use some humility because the story was written to show me me. When I read the Pharisees, I see a mirror and I say, oh Jesus, help me. We need humility. Humility only comes when we choose a silence to learn. But we can't stop there. The third one I want to share this morning is this. We need the silence to listen. If the silence to learn is where we get the roots of humility, then the silence to listen is where we yield the fruit called compassion. And that matters immensely because maturity in the kingdom of God is not measured by the one who knows, but by the one who loves. Jesus didn't say, people will know you are my disciples by how loud your conviction is, but by how loud your compassion is. See, that's the measuring stick. You want to know, what does it look like to really look like Jesus said, before you ever open your mouth to talk your conviction, then you need to check the gauge and the barometer of your passion and your compassion. So let's be honest. People can be annoying, right? Can we just say it? People can do some really annoying things, right? People can be infuriating, right? I mean, Christianity would be easy if it weren't for the people. That's just the truth. Because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That'd be easy. But people can be infuriating. People can break your heart. People can anger you. But what could happen if the people of God adopted a new response and the next time we saw brokenness and sin and we were tempted to let our opinion fly, we instead chose to pause and remember our own blindness and His kindness? What if we were to pause and remember for just a minute that we're not the junior parent, we're just another child in this journey. And by the way, that person that you're so angry at, I want you to hear me, there's some place they see God and creation better than you do. I'm going to say it again. We think so unilaterally. Oh, their view on abortion is this, that, and the other. I'd say if you'd stop to listen. By the way, the best rule of debate, if you ever want to roll, run into debate, like actual debate classes, the best rule of debate, if you actually want to learn, is start with where you agree. 
Don't start with where you disagree. Start with where you see the world from the same lens because then you'll see exactly where you diverge to different paths to solve the problem. But we're in a culture that's not starting where we agree. We're vilifying where we disagree. I don't even know where that came from, but somebody needed that this morning. If we remember in that moment our own blindness, God's kindness, if we remember they're our brother and our sister that we're not above them, and we'd simply stop in the moment we want to let our opinion fly. You say, how do I respond when you're ready to respond? This is what you need to do. You need to hit your knees and you need to ask God to give you a revelation for how he sees them. Because the truth is this world needs a love that will cover a multitude of sins. Here's a news flash for us. The entire world does not need your every opinion. The entire world does not need my take on everything that's going on. It's not like God's up in heaven going, good Ammons is on that today, because otherwise we'd be stuck if we didn't hear his opinion on what's happening in that world event. But some of us take to Facebook as if we're like the White House press reporter, right? Like, I'm here live on the scene right now, and I was just looking at CNN, and it reported this. Do you know this? Please reply with your thoughts. Like, some of us just need to chill and step back and take the silence to listen. What does it look like? It's this. When you encounter the dirty or the deceived, those who have tasted grace will never be found taking a public stand before spending much time on a private knee. You want to know what it looks like? Very practically, you say, there's this group or this person or this stance. I hear Christians come all the time. Well, well, what are you going to say about homosexuality? I'd say this. When encountering the dirty or the deceived, those who have tasted grace will never be found making a public stand before first spending much time on a private knee. I'm convinced revival will take place in our country when we spend more time pleading with God for broken people than talking to everyone else about them. So we come to the place of compassion. Without compassion, we find that we're going to end up cold or clinical. You will believe that your job as a Christian is to diagnose and put people in boxes when you've been made to embrace them and rescue them. When you've been made to see the same Savior, the same Father. And so I want to remind us this morning of this. It is easy to report the news. It's easy to look at brokenness and go, that's broken, that's not working. It's easy to put people in boxes. It's easy to complain. But what if? What if we as believers, from this point forward... You took that person, and I want you to think right now about a person you have a hard time showing grace to. You got them in your head? Don't look at them if they're in the room. That's not nice. (laughs) It's you. Don't do that. I want you to think about a person you have a hard time extending grace to. I want you to think about a stance or an issue in this life that you see it, and you watch how it's manipulated. You just see the enemy's fingerprints all over it. You see how he's twisting and manipulating people, but you're getting angry and you're getting offended. You got it in your mind? The thing that you would be tempted to just, man, if it was a safe enough place, I'd just let everybody know my opinion. What could happen if instead, today you'd take that thing and you'd hit your knees and ask this question. God, what do you say about them? God, what do you say? You created them. You love them more than anything. So if they're dangerously and disastrously off course, then nobody's more heartbroken than you. I'm not going to speak. God, what do you say about them? And then a second question. You ready? God, what do you want to do about it? Do we think Jesus still wants to set people free from things that destroy them? Jesus is about that, right? Nobody's more passionate about it. So when we see broken people, wouldn't we do better to hit our knees and say, God, what do you say about them? Oh, they're beloved. They're my child. They love me. By the way, you want to know the group I have the hardest time with? I'll just go ahead and tell you. I'll let you in my prayer closet. It's Christians. It's Christians who do the very thing that I'm preaching about today. Listen, that's my hardest time on the planet. Seriously. You take atheists, you can take people in any other stance, sin, thing. It's the people who bear the name of Christ that I struggle to see them loving like Jesus would. So you know what I got to do when I want to take to my keyboard and be like, you Pharisees! I hit my knees and I say, God, what do you say about them? He says, oh, they're zealous for me. But there's a place their zeal's without knowledge. But they want me. They burn for me. Do you see they burn for me so much? They're willing to be ostracized. They're willing to be left out. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't it beautiful that they lay down everything for me? And I say, yeah, it is. But what they're saying is stupid. (laughs) 
And then he reminds me of my own blindness. Do you remember all the dumb things that you've said? Do you remember all the places that I've changed? Do you remember all the places I've taken you? Do you understand even now when you hit your knees, there's some dumb things you're saying too? And my love is covering a multitude of sins. Then I could shift in humility and say, God, what do you want to do about this? Because it's easy to complain. It's easy to say, the problem with this Christian thing and that thing and that thing and that thing, it's a hard thing to get on your knees and say, God, where can I be a part of the solution? What do you want to do about it? What would happen if we hit our knees before we spoke, we asked two questions, God, what do you say about it? What do you want to do about it? And we would only speak once we had that. Four times in the Gospel of John, it says that Jesus only said what the Father was speaking. What could happen if Christians became known for the same? We got a minute. Can I get on a soapbox for just a minute? It's not a real soapbox, if you're wondering. It's just a stool. Throughout the last few years, there are a number of people that have misunderstood my heart on issues of race, politics, theology, about every area you can understand. And as they've misunderstood my heart, they've assumed some things that they've let me know. Some of them have thought that I'm afraid to be controversial. Others have come and said, you know, I think the thing is, you're just so nice. You're just, you're just so nice. You're just like a teddy bear. You're just a nice guy. And so you don't want to say anything that's not nice because you're nice. Some would say, you've just come, you're just too soft. Others have said to me, I think you're just naive. Like you just really, you don't deal with the things because you don't really know how the world works. Others, and this has been the last three years, by the way, this doesn't happen a ton, but it happens. Others have assumed that I've adopted some new controversial doctrine because of something I didn't say. So I just want to say something about this for a minute. Um, I've worked on the front lines with broken people and issues for the last two decades. Went through 11 years of intense theological education, and I've spent the past 20 years devouring books and studies on the nature of God and sin and hell and sexuality and ethics. I have lots of questions, and I've amassed hours and hours and hours and hours and hours dancing on the front lines in issues and in relationships in the midst of controversy. So I want to say to anybody who looks at my silence and is confused, it ain't any of those things that you've thought. Here's the issue. There's a brand of Christianity that's out right now that is mistaken defending righteousness with shunning and vilifying and even name-calling people and issues and groups they disagree with. And these people have wanted me to take a stand, to point a finger and make very clear where I stand on these things. And I just want to say, if you're waiting for me to do that or you're waiting for Overflow Church to do that, you're going to be disappointed. And there's a reason. Because this has been my prayer that I've taken before the Lord every day. It's this, Father, may I never allow the graffiti the enemy is painting on someone's soul to blind me from recognizing the artwork of the image of God that was there first. Say, why are you silent? Why aren't you calling them out? Why don't you just say that God thinks this and that and that and that about them? Because I never want to allow the graffiti the enemy is painting on someone's soul to overshadow the artwork of God, the image of God that was placed there first. So I want to make this very clear. I believe the cross is big enough to find and save and heal anyone. And when I walk in ministry, the majority of the people I walk in ministry with who live some very broken lifestyles, okay, of every sexual sin, you can imagine the persuasions of gender identity, of all these things, and there are people that go, why aren't you taking a stand? Because you know what's happening is they're approaching the world as orphans. And when you meet an orphan, the first thing they need to hear is the adoration and the beauty and the safety and the love of their father who came to rescue them in their weakest place, not your obsession with their particular brand of sin. And by the way, if you're that serious about righteousness, then where do I hear you preaching about gluttony or disobedience to parents or everything else that ends up in the same list that homosexuality is in? I'm a little passionate about that. Sorry. I want to say this. If you want to know why I'm silent, it's because I have chosen to walk very carefully in how I talk about precious ones Jesus shed his blood for and he presently adores. And I want to make sure that my words are aligned to lead to redemption and not rejection. So if you're around me 
you will know that I have a lot to say about a lot. So if there's somewhere you think I'm silent, it's highly likely I'm doing what I just preached. It's highly likely that I'm asking deep and uncomfortable and controversial questions. That I'm challenging old popular religious assumptions. That I'm welcoming the Holy Spirit to teach me and to refine me and to give me a burning conviction that looks like his heart for people. I'm asking him to give me a language that represents the love and the power and the transformation of the Father that I won't be able to shut up about. But until I get that, I hope you don't hear anything from me. Because the world doesn't need another opinion. The world doesn't need another arrogant assumption. The world doesn't need another unrefined truth grenade that's being launched from three miles away because we've yet to choose relationship with the people we feel hell-bent on correcting. So let me just say this, and I'll use this as an example because the one I hear the most today is homosexuality. And I want to say I have, I have lots. We could talk about this, of God's designs for sexuality and the way that you have the freedom and the fullness of what that looks like and how beautiful it is. But when there are people going, why won't you just rail out against a whole group? My first question is, how many homosexuals do you know, love, and hug and show the adoration of the Father to? And until that's taking place, you can zip it on your righteousness. Because you didn't hear God so loved the world that he came to hold a picket sign at a distance. God so loved the world that he incarnated into our dirtiest and weakest place and he came and he held us. And the only people Jesus was ever controversial with were the religious people that forgot that fact. The broken and the sinners, the partiers, they're like, we've got to have Jesus at this jam. This is going to be awesome. They loved him because they recognized his grace. The world needs God's gaze and his grace. And yes, often the world needs his corrective love. But it is only going to land when we stop talking long enough to let the refiner's fire touch our tongues. When we step into next week, I want to be very practical about how we respond with the transformational power of the gospel when it's time for us to speak. I want to talk next week about how you can walk in a way that holds the love and the power of God to set people free for your family, your friends, your co-workers. We're going to talk about how you were made for it. And regardless of what your personality is, it's made to flow through you. You're going to get confidence and ridiculous joy. But listen to me. Before we're ready to know what words we need to speak, there are three attributes we deeply need to have. Defining our hearts. Perspective. And humility. And compassion. And so as we start today, where I want to start is I want to start by asking us together to repent. Now that's a word that has gotten a bad rap in religious circles, but repent, it literally means to turn around and to change the way you think. Repent was the word Jesus was talking about when he said, you want to be great? Then change your thinking and be a child again. You want to be great? Then stop feeling like you have to be the savior of the world and the definer of everything. Stop feeling like everything rides on your opinion and just come be a kid again. Normally, this is the point in the service where I'd ask you to stand with me, but today I want to ask that we would sit for just a minute. I'm going to ask if you'd close your eyes with me, and I just want to ask a very simple question. How have you been responding to a broken world? How have you been responding? Let's make it personal. The world's broken. The world's anxious. Are there places you need to retract some words or some attitudes or some opinions? I want to challenge you right now with your eyes closed to think about that group or that person or that issue you're really struggling to extend grace to. That place where, if you're not careful, you're elevating the graffiti the enemy is putting above the image of God he's painted. And what I want to ask you to do with that is not to push it down. I want to ask you not to take shame. I simply want to ask you to be honest. What has your response been to a broken world? Has it been anger? Has it been judgment? Has it been panic and fear? You find yourself chasing mild conspiracies or building little bunkers. I want to ask right now, are there any words that you've spoken? Any attitudes that you've held that you need to take back? 
I want you to think about that somebody who hurt you or that group that offends you. And I want you just to ask this question in the stillness right now. God, what do you say about them? Would you hear him wash over you and say, I say they're to die for. I say they're my favorite kid. Would you ask the question, God, what do you want to do about this and where can I play my part? Some of you have been walking with the weight of the world on your shoulders for your family, for an issue. I watch that a lot. Listen, where you have a passionate heart, it's easy to shift from being an advocate to an accuser. It's easy. When you care deeply about something and believe it's up to you. Where is it you need to lay down a burden today? As you're there in silence, I want to ask the question, where is it that you need the silence to learn? Where is it right now you actually have your own questions of God, but you felt it was too sacrilegious to ask? When I told you a minute ago the last 20 years I've been devouring books, the reason isn't because somebody told me to, it's because I have lots of conflicting questions when I look at brokenness in the world. I've got lots of questions of my God that I thought were too sacrilegious to ask and instead he invited me in silence to say, no, you're safe in this house to be a kid. Ask anything you want. Where is it you need to wrestle with what you believe so that you get a refined and an informed faith that you know the reason for the hope that you have? I want to tell you that thing that comes up Maybe right now I brought that one up about homosexuality, and you're like, yeah, what does God say about that? What is that? Because I hear two different views coming from the church right now, and what's the third way that God would want for me? I would tell you that's your place in silence to go and run. And as the teaching pastor of our church, I don't have all the answers, but I've had lots of questions. So on just about any issue you could ask, I probably have a resource to point in your way where you can get still before your father and hear his truth and receive his heart. Where is it he wants you to be silent so you can learn? The last question I want to ask is this. I'm going to ask you sitting there to go from closing your eyes to just look at these screens one more time with me. Because we desperately need stillness, guys. The environment we need, if you want to know how to be refreshed in this world and to look like the love and the aroma of Christ, we need stillness. So I'm going to ask, what is one tangible step you could take this week? I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you right now. What's a tangible step where you're saying, you know what, this week, this is how you can choose stillness. This is how you can detox your soul. This is how you can be still and know again that I am God. Perspective and humility and compassion, they're forged in stillness and formed in silence. The last thing I want to do before I have you stand with me As we pray about things like this, when we look internally at ourselves, it can be very easy to start to feel weights and burdens that come on us, right? Maybe like me, you've thought about something that you've said about somebody else or an attitude that you've held and it's ugly and you want to feel shame. I want to remind you right now, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There's only the safe and secure embrace of a father who says, hey, it's safe to grow up. So this morning, if you looked and you said... I was holding this attitude about this group and I want to shift from that. Congratulations, you've just become great in the kingdom of God. Because what you did, whether you knew it or not, is in that place, you changed your thinking to get out of the instructor's seat to be a child and you're already there. So the worst thing you could do today is leave with heaviness on you. That'd be the worst lie of the enemy. So this is what I want to ask each person to do right now. If there's any place where there's something that you laid down before the Lord to say, Lord, wow, this is where my attitude hasn't been right. This is where I haven't walked in the right way. I'm going to ask right now that you would literally see it like you're taking off a weighted vest. And I want you to imagine yourself right now laying it down and putting it at your feet that you would not leave with it here. Father, I ask for each of us today that we would be people They would be silent long enough to allow your refiner's fire to touch our tongues so that when we speak, we would sound like the aroma of Christ. I pray weights and burdens would lift now. I pray revelation would be released now. And I pray that we would walk in a way that would release your hope. you agree with that? I want to ask if you would stand with me, and I just want to close this service in a blessing. 
So right now as we go, I bless you. In a broken world, I bless you this week to not grow weary in doing good, to not be jaded, to not give up hope, to not let your love grow cold. And anywhere in your life your love has grown cold and you have been jaded, I bless you right now this week with your Father just to be honest and to let His peace come over you. That you wouldn't wear it around like a scarlet letter. I want to say there's no more shame for you being jaded. It actually means that you care very deeply. You just need to change your perspective and that's found in stillness. I bless you today to ask questions. And I ask that as you wrestle, I hope you will go home and wrestle with deeper questions about the nature of our God and theology and politics. And as you do, I pray that you be led to his feet, that you would see and look and smell like him. That you would walk as a learner, hungry everywhere you go. I bless you to hear his heart clearly this week with those that you struggle with. I bless you as you seek stillness. And right now, in the name of Jesus, I just pray peace over your home, and over your family, that as you move forward to have his heart, as you move forward to learn, I pray that he would water that soil. He would take the roots deep and make the fruit abundant. That we together would walk as a happy new us with a happy new response. And if you agree with that, say amen. Amen. Well, tonight we want to invite you back. Again, next week when we come, we're going to talk about our actual physical response. But tonight, we've got a family meeting here at 6 p.m. We just had our two-year birthday last week, which was awesome. We still got the decor going, and we're going to come have the rest of our party tonight. So at 6 o'clock, we're going to have desserts and coffee, and then we're going to walk through a lot of the practical steps we're taking together as a church. You don't want to miss it. God bless you. May you go in the peace of the Lord, and may we walk in a new response today. Have a great Sunday.